You're listening to Partnernomics Podcast, where we discuss the art and science of developing successful strategic partnerships. To learn more about the suite of Partnernomics solutions, visit Partnernomics.com. Welcome back to another episode of Partnernomics Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Brigman. And on today's show, we get a chance to chat with Derek again, Derek Agos. And uh, Derek and I had a chance to catch uh, up a little bit this time, but we uh, had a chance. Derek was actually one of the first people that was on the Partnernomics Podcast. And uh, man, just love the energy he brings. Love what he's, uh, now he's with TaylorMade, TaylorMade Golf. And uh, doing some awesome stuff over there. Derek, good to check in with you again. Yeah, great to talk to you. I'm excited. Thanks for having me back on. So, man, you're going to have to give me a little update. So now you're at uh, TaylorMade putting your skills to work there. Uh, <laughs> man, what, is, what has it been like? Tell me, tell oh, me a little bit. It's been, it, it's been an amazing change, right? So I came from a startup, to and, and when I made the decision to leave, uh, the past company wasn't any other reason that I wanted just more challenge. I wanted something new. I kind of set forth of kind of what I was looking for. You know, I wanted to go work for anywhere from a 500 to a billion dollar company. Um, I wanted to be somewhere where I could push and challenge the status quo. I didn't want to kind of just be a cog in the system. Um, and was looking for those kind of opportunities and this came up and as i went through the whole entire process with everything it was the one that made sense more more important than anything else like one i'm a lover of golf i'm a newer golfer which i'll call you know a covid golfer uh you know as a lot of people a lot of people did uh given that you couldn't do much of anything else you had to do something um, <laughs> to get outside and it's pretty easy to stay distanced on the golf course right oh, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um but yeah i didn't have the i wasn't saying i wanted to go work in the golf industry it was not something that i wanted to do but as i was looking at different industries it was one one of those things i was like oh this is not really who i am outside of being a golfer However, there's this new world coming into golf. There's a really exciting time in golf. COVID, you know, did a number of amazing things for golf between, it was one of the limited sports that you could do. Um, product sales were up, you know, people were looking for that connection and energy. It was something they could do with a small group of friends. It was, you know, munis were attainable. Um, and so it just turned into that exciting area and out of it, all the other conversations I was having and offers I got, it was the one that made the most sense out of everything, given what I was looking for and what I wanted to do. And it's just been the past five months, which has been unbelievable, has been just phenomenal. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. For man. a company like TaylorMade. Yeah. Well, anybody that's watched golf uh, knows that there's no shortage of technology in golf. You know, <laughs> and we say that every company is a technology company, no matter if you're manufacturing pencils or you're, you know, one of the you know, tens of thousands of, of SaaS companies that are out there. But talk to us a little bit about, you know, technology. I know you're a lover of technology, but uh, uh, what, what kind of stuff are you? I mean, obviously, don't give away any secrets, but uh, I know you're working <laughs> on some good uh, high class uh, and, and, high, and high top secret stuff out there at TaylorMade. Yeah. But uh, what, what are some of the partnerships? What are some of the different things that you're working on? Yeah, I mean, TaylorMade as a whole is known for pushing the elements of what we do with our equipment, right? Um, primarily in the driver space, but, you know, iron space, you know, the P-series have just been, been phenomenal. Um, you know, and so innovation and performance is humongous drivers for us. So we actually look at that across the board inside of the whole entire company. And that was what was very intriguing to me is how do you work for an equipment company that also wants to take that concept and drive it across everything they're doing from sales department to digital to e-com to connection like how are you doing things differently you know taylor made is you know our marketing is hands down the best in the industry but how do you back that up right you can have the best marketing you can have all that it can be flashy it can be sexy it can be all these things but at the end of the day you really have to back it up and so we're constantly looking at how to push that element um yeah i mean in you know, everything we do is with, with that thought. 
Um, as far as what I'm doing, yeah, I mean, working primarily in the digital space, I mean, it does connect from tangibility of product to digital, but like, you know, we're exploring more digital assets and realms of connecting to the everyday golfer from high handicap to low handicap, right? So how do we really get connected to the consumer? How do we provide elements for them, everything to better their golf game? Um, not just equipment wise, but that connection wise, like how do we become part of their daily ritual? Um, and sometimes that's daily for a lot. And sometimes that's twice a week and, you know, and everything in between. So. And the thing that I love about kind of where we are just as, as an economy is there's more opportunity now for, for manufacturers, those large companies, like let's say a tailor made. Yeah to to be to have a real relationship with their customers and not have any intermediaries anymore no and so yeah i think really within this last i would say 5 years 10 years there's you know there's there's this opportunity for this relationship for customers to get information from us to purchase directly from us to get yes. solutions like you're talking about performance solutions, right? I want to be, I want to be a better golfer. Uh, you know, I think there's solutions coming down the pike now where you're actually going to be able to, to have those directly from the manufacturers. You don't necessarily have to have dealers and these intermediaries that play the gatekeeper anymore. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I've thought about this a lot over the past few years is retail is changing, right? Re the, you know, what it was 20 years ago is not necessarily what it is today and it's not what it's going to be tomorrow but will retail go away no never like, <laughs> especially like for somebody like me like i don't mind ordering offline but i'm more inclined to buy something if i'm physically in the store and i get to touch it that's not everybody but there is you know we're trained this way it's what we we're brought up doing um you know, I think the new, you know, the new kids, the new, the youngins coming in, it's a little bit different. They're definitely trained more in a digital, digital realm. Um, I just see the face of retail just changing a little bit and providing a little bit more connection. And, you know, I think that's happening. You know, stores are transforming from just a standard walk-in things on the shelf into you know, experiences and then being able to bridge that gap between the tangible experience inside of the four walls to a digital realm. And I think, you know, it, you know, it's like the saying is, you know, all, you know, low tide rises all sinking ships, right? Or high tide rate raises all sinking ships. And working together with retail and our e com and all of it's, it's, it's the puzzle piece, right? You sure you can lose one and you'll still be a great company. But if you have all the elements putting together, you're connecting with the consumer at the end of the day in the most positive way. You're you're giving them what they're looking for. So this person wants to buy off e-com because they work 18 hours a day and they just want to ride home. They want to think about going to a big box store or mom and pop or a green grass. But then you also have somebody, you know, like me that wants to go inside of a store and touch it, and hit it and play with it, and feel it and everything. And I think that's where we're going. It's we're in an experience market. People want more experiences. They want more touch points. They want more connection to the brands. They want to feel that they're part of that journey. And we want to feel part of that journey with them. Yeah, it seems just recently, I was in Nashville doing a, a keynote for a, a company that I'll traditionally call a product company, right? Whenever I think about TaylorMade, traditionally, I think of them as a physical product company. Oh, we're a product company, yeah. without question. But into the future, to your point, their customers want kind of these holistic solutions and they want these holistic experiences, which yeah. as a partnering guy, and you also as a partnering guy... <laughs> It's really exciting for us because this yeah. really opens the door. Now there's no longer a lid. There's no longer limitations on who to partner with. And we really have the opportunity now to jump out on the fringes 
to do partnerships in very different spaces, whether it's the digital side, it's the experience side, the, like you're talking about on the retail side, the golf simulators, these, there's all of these different opportunities to really pull in the experience and, and really just adds to the, the brand. And just that the experience and the value that customers get from that, uh, you know, from, from that approach. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I think, you know, we talked about this right before we, we jumped on, but is the experience is everything to the customer, right? Or the consumer. Um, they're looking for those moments. And if you can tap into with them, now they're becoming loyal, right? So, you know, Lululemon isn't Lululemon because they don't have a loyal, loyal fan base. They, they made a connection, they provided a service to that community. And so we're looking to do the same. You know, how do you provide that service and that connection? So it's not just picking up your SIM2 driver, right? It's actually like, I love my SIM2 driver. Everything that TaylorMade's about, like I love the connection to it. I love the marketing. I love the way it feels in my hand. I love the sound of the crack of the ball off the face. Um, bringing all of those elements in to provide a better and stronger connection. Sure, at the end of the day, partnerships and uh, you know product companies are you've got to sell product, right? You know we're here to make money. We're here to do those things. But it's not about that 100% anymore. I think the days of it just being a transactional piece and why I believe partnerships are going the way they're going and getting bigger and stronger and people like you and myself look at partnerships in a very unique way um, will be redefining. Um, you know, we talked about this right before we hopped on too, is like, you know, I think in the, in the past, you know, partnerships was looked at as a very sales element, right? If you're a partnership guy, you're nine times a 10 on the sales team. It was very transactional. You get your logo here, you give us X and you get this exposure and toss out stuff and do things like that. That's fine and dandy, right? It has to evolve from that at some point in time. So you have to be able to take that step up and, the consumer is inundated with so many things today, right? There's, if you go to buy a pen, there's 14,000 pens out there. How are you going to choose? Okay, well, I need to hold it. I need to touch it. I need to write. How does it write? Like, you know, oh, well, this is my pen. And now I'm going to use this pen because this pen works best for me. How do you evolve that? And how do you continue to change it and create a deeper connection? with that consumer instead of just being like you need to buy this pen and this person buys this pen over here so therefore you need to have it no it's they want that they want they want to feel that inflection between the two things they want and that's where i feel like partnerships going it's it's going into experiences it's going into really tapping in one on one with the consumer instead of it just being 100% transactional um, that's what excites me about partnerships in general. Um, and partnerships goes across the board, right? It's not, it, there's social partnerships, there's brand on brand partnerships, there's sales partnerships. Partnership is such a vast and nuanced word. Um, I think that's where the creativity comes from. And how do you get creative to provide a moment in time for the consumer? So. Talk to us a little bit, Derek, about what, you know, from, from your vantage point, and now that you're, you know, on the inside of TaylorMade, yeah. what, what was golf 10 years ago, and what is golf going to be five or 10 years from now, and how, right. how will partnerships help us get there? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I wish I could talk to 10 years ago. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm what you call a COVID golfer. I played a little bit throughout my career and this and meet on the golf course and have, you know, 10 beers and get sloshed or, Hey, we're having a meeting and, you know, here it is. And, and me, you know, chunking and or, you know, slicing, slicing the ball sideways. Um, over the past three years, what I've seen though is, and more importantly, over the past two years is it's gone into this place of golf actually becoming cool. And the moment when you can tap into that cool 
it's the people that are playing it. It's the equipment that you're using. It's the colors. It's the feeling, you know, like, you know, bag vibes are a thing, you know, head covers and like, this is differentiating. Um, I get this and you might, you know, you're, you're on the course with, with your friends and you have a head cover they couldn't get their hands on or they didn't know where to find it or something like that. It's a really big kind of connection there. So I see golf moving more to that direction, unique pieces, unique places, stronger connection. Um, the, I don't necessarily say that the days of, of country club golf is gone because there is a very deep rooted tradition there. And I hate to see tradition go away because I think it's actually tradition in golf is actually one of the most unique things. I mean, you start uncovering all these different layers of tradition gets really unique, but there's all this other side of Muni golf and accessible golf. And, and, and I believe golf is for everybody. I think partnerships will start to ring that in while not always looking at endemic, but non-endemic partnerships, right? Like how do you start bleeding the difference between one another? You know, our econ team has done a phenomenal job of, you know, we're getting the licensing and I have the background in licensing. Um, so it's exciting for me to see it. Um, but we've got, you know, MBA out there. And so you can actually have in MBA license balls and head covers. You know, once you kind of start tapping into that, now you're tapping into realms and places in people's normal daily life. I'm a diehard football fan. I'm a diehard basketball fan. I'm a diehard, you know, for me, football, soccer fan, you know, and then you're being able to, but then also still providing the very traditional partnerships with golf, right? How to better golf and, you know, tech is getting bigger and, and stronger and, you know, launch monitors and all of the, you know, range finders and GPS watches and location and, you know, all these things are really starting to increase. Um, so I just think it opens a door for partnerships in so many different levels, ways that people never even thought about and getting away from just sponsoring event that we, we constantly need to do that and be at the forefront. And I think when you're a company like this, I think it's very valuable and, and smart to constantly be brand heavy out and about. And, um, but, you know, I think there's very unique moments that are going to open the door in the next two years for partnerships, everything from tech that you would never see it coming on AI and all of these things all the way to a very, you know, traditional partnership where, you know, it's, you're integrating something into something that is golf on golf. Yeah. Derek, talk to us a little bit about kind of the tactical, some of the tactical pieces with uh, partnering. And that is whenever you are evaluating a new partner, you have this new initiative, yeah. you're cranking out. And uh, so you're, you're kind of, walking up to the batter's box, so to speak. Uh, I mean, what's kind of some of the first steps that you look at and whenever you're evaluating uh, partners, what is, what does that look like? Yeah, it's, it's interesting for me because I run it through what I call my funneling system, right? So I look at our brand um, and I think this can go across the board for anybody, um, but I build it based on where I'm at, right? So now I'm at Taylor Maiden, so I built this fun funneling system. And about 90% of it is in my head, but I know what, you know, the mission statement is. I know what our promise to the consumer is. I know. So all of that just kind of lives in my head. So when I start evaluating a partnership, I, you know, there's a lot of research in the very beginning and I always look for very unique moments. Like there's two sides to it, right? There's like, we can get this done. This is great. Let's just go ahead and do it easy. Sometimes not easy, but this makes a lot of sense. Then there's the other side of it where you kind of have to tap into a little bit deeper, like how does this make sense? And start peeling back that onion and uncovering all those things. So I always start with research. Does this make sense? Are we, are we going to connect to the consumer? How are we going to connect to the consumer? Who's in this space that I potentially could talk to? If I have a very unique idea and it's very directive of this is what I want to do. If there's one person that makes it easy, if there's 10, you know, you kind of have to go through that and then just start uncovering and kind of running it through, you know, this funneling process. Like, 
does it connect to the brand? Does it provide insight to the, the consumer? Does it provide connection? Is it all of these things? And once I can kind of get through that and, and hit all those checkpoints, and for me, it's got to hit my list of checkpoints. And it's not 75% of the checkpoints, it's 100%. And those checkpoints are only four, but if one is off the table, then it doesn't really fit in kind of what I want to accomplish. From there, then it's like, okay, what would it take to get this done? Is there a budget? Is it, is it a double budget? Meaning budget from one side to the other side? Is it all, is it one-sided partnership? Meaning like, are we pulling it in 100% our realm? Is it both parties at the table to provide marketing and touch points and all these things? Like, and so you start running through those. And then from there, it's really starting getting into the nitty gritty. Like, what does, what does the budget look like? What, what are we going to allocate to it? How are we going to really bring it, bring it to life? And, you know, I think, you know, this is like, you can do a partnership in a month. That's great. Those are cute. But the ones that actually take six, six, seven, eight, nine months to really dive in and have those conversations are the ones that I feel that are really meaningful. And even more so when both parties are at the table, aiming for the same goal. Um, and those are really hard to come by. Yeah, man, I love that. What I what can I hear you say is there's this cultural aspect of working Absolutely. with another company. And then obviously there's that strategic aspect. And if you if you compromise on either one, you're setting yourself up for failure. It's better to have no deal than a bad yeah. deal. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can't remember if we, we talked about this on the last episode, but every contract that I go into I go into it with, with two mindsets. If we're going to a contract, all of the hard work is done and we're getting the deal points and those kind of situations. But I truly believe that both parties should be at the table. And if one party walks away from the table and is like, amazing, great, I got everything I wanted, then it wasn't negotiated properly. You really have to leave that table and make both parties feel uncomfortable of like, we're taking a chance, we're taking a chance here. And this is all in the right partnership, right? And because then it really will bring both parties to the table to achieve the ultimate goal. And I've seen the most success with those. Um, and the other piece is I was going to every negotiation um, with trying to pre-negotiate as much as possible. I hate back and forth, right? Hammer out the numbers before, make sure you're on the same page, make sure there's no surprises. There's always going to be a surprise from the legal or attorney. You're, they're going to tuck in something or it's a protection piece that you may miss. But for the most part, try to get, you know, I always try to get about 90% of it done. So that way you're, what you're hung up on is those things. And you just let the, let the, let the attorneys hammer that one out. Yeah. One last question here, Derek, before we let you go. Yeah. And that is, you know, I know you've been doing this uh, partnering thing for, for a long time as I have. Yeah. What's, what's the best piece of advice that you got from a mentor back in the day that really set you on, the, on, on a strong course for a great career in partnering? That's an interesting question. I actually really like that. You're going to make me think. Wow. <laughs> Normally, I can just shoot from the cuff. Um, I think one of the best pieces of advice I ever, ever got um, and I can translate it. I have a unique ability to be able to take things and kind of place them in other places. So it doesn't necessarily always make sense to anybody else, but it makes sense to me. And that's, I think that, that's all that matters at this point. Um, but I was with Randy Jackson, um, which obviously is American Idol and, you know, that fame and phenomenal producer. And we were talking about, and this is when I was in the music industry and we were talking about this artist I was looking at. And I was like, oh my God, his songwriting is amazing. The band's phenomenal. His presence on stage is great, all these things. And I played the song and he's like, yeah, this is really good, blah, blah, blah. He's like, can I see what he, what he looks like? And I was like, absolutely. And so I pulled it up and he looked at me and he goes, okay. And I was like, you're not, you're not digging, are you? And I was like, I don't need you to dig it. I just wanted your opinion. And he goes, I just have one question for you. Is he a star? And my answer to him was, not at this point in time, we can make him a star. And he goes, that's not what I asked you. Is he a star? And from that moment in time, I've always taken that thought process 
in anything and everything I do is you can mold and create something as much as you possibly can, but it doesn't necessarily fit. It doesn't necessarily always mean it's right. So one partnership to another, there is a star and the stars align properly. So I always look at it in that way with the best intention is like, is this a star? Can it be a star? How much work does it have to go in the star? Um, and then the other piece on it is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a really big one for me is like, once you uncover, you know, all the research and I don't think enough people do enough research, right? And it's nothing against people's process. This is 100% my process. I believe in research, 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 research. I'm getting better at data, 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 but I want to, I want to undercover every little piece that I can to understand the functions and how it would move instead of being like, we like this idea, this is how we can do it and kind of lean on marketing to make it shine, right? Like you got to have the engine of the car done right in order to, to put the shell. So I kind of look at all those kind of pieces to really suss through every partnership that we're doing and, and make sure it's right. Yeah, I love that, man. What I hear is you don't want to compromise. You know, no. if, if you need somebody to, 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 to bring it and to give you the solution <laughs> to fill that, as you mentioned, I think you, you said kind of that puzzle piece. Uh, yeah. if, if somebody, if a company, if an organization can only be half of that puzzle piece, don't compromise to it because your wishing and your hoping is not going to get them to grow to be the full puzzle piece. So yeah, uh, you got to keep don't researching. Come. You got to keep looking. Yeah. You got to keep yeah. recruiting. And don't compromise, right? Like th there's a give and take. But the moment time you compromise, like specifically working for a brand, right? If you compromise your brand to fit with something because you think it's this amazing thing, you are not doing the brand justice. You're not doing what you're working on justice. And ultimately, you're going to end up hurting to a certain level of what you're accomplishing. And I think you have to always know your worth. I think you need to know your worth as a person. You need to be able to be very self-aware as best as you possibly can, but also understand the brand you work for and, and kind of look at and go, okay, does this make sense? Just because it's this and this, they've got this many followers and they've got, they've done this much business and they've done that. Like there's so many different layers below that, that if you start compromising on those just to fit it in, it, in my opinion, just doesn't always work. Yeah, it, great advice. It may work for a second, but that's about it. Yeah, awesome. Well, Derek, it's been great catching up with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Keep up the awesome work there, Taylor Made, man. We're gonna continue to watch uh, you continue yeah. to, to grow the business and come up with some new solutions. Yeah, I'm super excited. Uh, we'll have to circle back in the new year once I can uh, bring you in the fold of what we're doing more. And uh, uh, 2022 is going to be an exciting, exciting year for, I think, golf in general. But at least for TaylorMade, we're, we're, we're forging ahead and going to redefine the industry of what we're doing. Man, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Thanks, awesome. Derek. Awesome. Thank you so much. See you, buddy. Have a good day. All right. Cheers. Partnernomics Podcast is brought to you by Partnernomics. Learn how to leverage the power of partnership. To listen to more episodes of Partnernomics Podcast, visit Partnernomics.com.